All right, everybody, we can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Montana Campus Compact's Community Building Institute. Um, my name is Maggie Hansen, and I work with Montana Campus Compact as the AmeriCorps VISTA Program Specialist and as the coordinator for this year's um, CBA. So before we jump into the first presentation today, I just wanted to go over um, who Montana Campus Compact is and what kind of work we do, as well as um, a more in-depth overview of CBI, and then um, some more details about the micro-credential, as well as giving you a chance to um, take your pre-survey before we start our presentation. All right, so before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. As we gather today to learn about responsible strategies for addressing community needs, many of us live in Montana and some of us are located elsewhere. Wherever we may be, it is important to recognize that for generations, the region today familiar to us as the United States of America has been peopled and stewarded by unique, distinct and prosperous groups of indigenous peoples. For centuries, colonization, invasion, and dishonesty have resulted in the displacement of these people from their spiritual and cultural homelands and the lands reserved to their sovereign rule by treaty. Here in Missoula, Montana, I am joining you from the ancest ancestral lands of the Katutnaha people. Today, the Katutnaha continue to inhabit this place and others, having joined with the Salish and Pendere peoples to form the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Wherever you may be, please join me in a moment of silence as we reflect upon the complex history of the lands that lie beneath our feet. for doing that. Um, that is just something we in Montana like to do to recognize our eight federally recognized tribal nations. All right, so who is Montana Campus Compact? As our name may suggest, we are a compact or a coalition of 18 colleges and universities across the state of Montana. Um, in that picture at the bottom of the slide, all our affiliate campuses are shown. As you can see, it's a variety of four-year universities, two-year community and technical, technical colleges, as well as some tribal colleges. Um, we are part of a national compact network. We were founded in 1993, and our main office is located on the University of Montana campus in the University in Missoula, Montana. Our work involves um, administering two AmeriCorps programs. One of those is the VISTA program, which um, involves indirect service and poverty alleviation, as well as capacity building. And our other program is the College Coach Program, which is more direct service with an emphasis on college persistence. Um, college persistence and poverty alleviation are the pillars of our mission. Um, and this is reflected through the fact that we host various awards and scholarships for students in our affiliate campuses, campus throughout the year. Um, we also encourage campus election engagement as well as um, uh, encourage campus food security through the um, creation of campus food pantries that serve both the campus and the surrounding community. Uh, we also hold different trainings and conferences throughout the year, one of these being the Community Building Institute, um, as well as other um, trainings for our AmeriCorps members throughout the year. So CBI um, is meant to prepare early career public professionals such as students, AmeriCorps members, nonprofit workers, um, aspiring change makers of all kinds to address community needs in a, responsible, in a responsible, equitable, and inclusive manner by centering the voices of community stakeholders. This year's CBI coordinator is me, and we have six guest presenters over the next couple of weeks, including a few from our office, like Callie, who will be presenting today, um, Pete, Josie, and Josh, as well as um, Morgan, who is one of our site supervisors for our VISTAs in Butte, Montana, um, with the Clark Chateau, and Kim, who works um, at University of Montana at the Center for um, Children, Families, and Workforce Development. Um, I'll also go into more detail about the micro-credential later on, but basically, if you complete this series, um, you will receive a micro-credential and digital badge from the University of Montana to verify the skills that you've gained here. 
And then our schedule is listed to the right. Um, basically, this will be held at the same time, Monday, Monday Wednesday, Friday, this week and next, 11, 11 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So this is the community building cycle around which the Community Building Institute is organized. Um, each presentation that you'll see over the next couple of weeks will feature a different step in the process. Uh, the first of which being assessment, which Callie will go over today, which is where you take time to assess your community's current resources and identify a need that may exist. Um, from there, you move on to engagement where you seek to get people interested in what's going on, make them aware of either an identified problem or a planned initiative. Once you have people engaged, you can get the people from your community involved by seeking their input um, and making them stakeholders in this process. From there, you move on to planning where you identify where you are and where you'd like to be and lay out some sustainable steps to get there. Um, and once your plan is in place, you're, you perform that plan where you execute the steps and keep the community up to date on the process, in the, on your progress in the meantime. Um, from there, you move on to the evaluation stage where you look back at the work you've done and judge um, whether you made a difference or not, and then use that reevaluation to improve the process in the future. Um, because this is a continuous cycle, you will continue enacting it um, through your time of service or your time in your community. All right, so a little more information about the micro-credential. A micro-credential is a digital form of certification indicating demonstrated competency or mastery of a specific skill or set of skills. Once you complete this course um, fully, you will receive a digital badge from the University of Montana that you can add to LinkedIn, resumes, social media, websites, really whatever online platform your heart desires. This just provides information that verifies the skills that you've developed in CBI to employers and other individuals. Badges are accessed via Credly. Um, once you complete this course and you're deemed eligible, uh, UM Online will email you um, how to download your badge. So in order to receive the micro-credential, you are required to attend all six sessions. If attendance is an issue for you, please feel free to shoot me an email and we can explore some alternative options. Um, you are also responsible for completing a pre-survey that you should have received in your email about 10 minutes ago, um, as well as a post-survey and six short session reflections. These reflections will be emailed to you at the end of each session, and you are just responsible for completing those by the end of the day. Um, I believe your post-survey, your six, your six um, session reflection and your final reflection, 250 words are bundled together. So that will be seven survey links that you will be responsible for completing by the end of this course. All right, so you should have received a link to your pre-survey in your email inbox. Um, if you haven't, let me know, but right now I will just give you five minutes to go ahead and complete that.
Uh, for those of you not seeing the survey, give me just one moment. I'll see if I can send that over to you. Um, yeah, definitely try checking your spam email if it's not showing up in your main inbox. It does sometimes look a little bit fishy when it comes from Qualtrics. All right, is anyone still not receiving the um, pre-survey, even in their spam inbox? Receive the pre-survey. Could you please throw your email in the chat box and I'll send it out real quick?
All right, just one moment. I'm going to resend that. Who's here, Beth? Okay, it should have been sent. Um, please let me know if you still haven't received it. It sh might show up in your spam folder, if not in your main inbox. Do you mind putting your email in the chat real quick and I can send it over to you? All right, just for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to our first presenter, um, Callie Foster. Um, if you haven't received if you haven't received or completed the survey yet, no worries, just do so when you get a minute um, and we can go ahead and get started. All right, Callie, are you able to share your screen? I should be. I'll give it a shot now. Maggie, can you confirm that you're just seeing the community assessment first slide and not the second slide? Uh, yeah, just the first slide. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as Maggie mentioned, my name is Callie Foster, um, and I am the Director of Programs here with Montana Campus Compact. Um, I've been here for a little over, actually, April will be six years, so I can't say a little over five years anymore. Um, I actually started in Maggie's position, um, and before that, I served two consecutive service terms in AmeriCorps. I did a direct service program called Energy Corps um, in Helena, Montana, with the Department of Environmental Quality. 
Um, I have a slide about um, that in later in the session. Um, but I served with a program called Smart Schools. Um, it stood for Saving Money and Resources Today, and it was focused on resource conservation within Montana K through 12 um, public schools. So today I'm gonna be um, presenting on community assessment. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. There's going to be, I'm gonna utilize the chat um, as well as breakout rooms later in the session. So feel free if there is a box um, on the screen that has a question for the chat, please feel free to just you know, put your answer in there um, and I'll try my best to review them as they come in and we'll kind of talk about them um, and I know there's, yeah, about 45 folks here, so I don't think I'll be able to get to all of them. Uh, but yes, we will be utilizing the chat. And Maggie, if you could monitor the chat, um, you know, during the session, that would be great as well. So let's ju ju just jump into it. So today um, I'm going to kind of run through um, these objectives in this order. So first I'm going to introduce um, community assessment what kinds of assessments there are, um, you know, tips on conducting an assessment. I'm gonna give a couple um, real world examples. Um, we're also gonna do a small group breakout and then we'll be able to wrap up um, and kind of talk about the key takeaways of the session. And I'm also gonna stick around um, until noon or so um, for any sort of questions or if anyone wants to kind of talk through um, their ideas. I will give a disclaimer. I'm not an expert in community assessment. I've kind of just been working in the anti-poverty and community needs um, sector um, within Montana Campus Compact and as well in my AmeriCorps service for about eight years or so. Um, so I just wanted to give that disclaimer. Um, if you have questions and I do not have, um, you know, the knowledge to answer them, I will make sure that um, I exhaust some of the resources that I do have to answer your questions or try to point you in the right direction. Okay, so introducing community assessment. Um, so first I want to, you know, go over some definitions of what is a community. Um, and while I'm reading the definition, feel free to share in the chat of what are some communities that you are currently a member of or have been a member of. And so um, pulling from the community toolbox, um, chapter three, what is a community? So while we traditionally think of a community as the people in a given geographical area, that's probably the easiest way to think about community. The word can really refer to any group sharing something in common. So think about smaller geographic areas, such as a neighborhood, a housing project or development, a rural area, or you can think of it as um, to a number of other possible communities within a larger geographical defined, defined community. Um, so it looks like we're getting some responses in the chat. Um, and it looks like um, someone responded and said, you know, the LGBTQ community, that is a really great example. Um, you know, being a parent, living in a semi-rural area, um, Campbell mentioned a university community, Abby mentioned AmeriCorps, um, Kayla mentioned being a VISTA, um, a Unitarian, um, Universalist, yes, absolutely, foster community, religious, um, Zen community, um, University of Montana Western, um, immigrant and refugees. These are all really great examples. Um, and I like that no one really mentioned anything about a geographical area just yet, um, global indigenous. Um, so those are some really great examples. Um, for me, when I think about the community that I am a part of, I think of, um, you know, national service, not only as an alum, but also someone that works within national service. Um, yeah, Alex mentioned living on a Native American reservation. That is a community as well. Um, I live in the Franklin DeFort neighborhood. Um, I try to be involved in there. So I think about that as a community. Um, I haven't done it in a while, but I was pretty heavily involved in a rock climbing community. So really you can think about a community um, in not only geographical areas, but the things that you do, the things that you have in common with people within that community. 
Okay, so moving along. Yeah, hiking community. That's a great answer. So um, getting further into de definitions of, you know, what is a need? So needs can be defined as the gap between what is and what should be. A need can be felt by an individual, a group, or an entire community. Um, it can also be as concrete as the need for food and water or as abstract as um, improved community cohesiveness. So what is a need that you hope to respond to? I'd love to see some responses in the chat. Food insecurity, medical inequality, social justice, housing, shelter and education, mental health needs, mental health in all caps, yep, affordable housing, transportation, um, activation of space in low income area parks, lots of education coming through. I keep seeing food insecurity, um, technology, food access. Yes, absolutely. I think those are some of our most pressing needs that uh, we all see in our communities. Um, yep, healthy food, um, access to scholarship funds. Yeah, so great answer. I see some people also liking other people's answers. I love to see that. Okay, and then what is an assessment? So a community assessment in this sense, in regards to CBI, it helps to uncover not only needs and resources, but the underlying culture and social structure that will help you understand how to address the community needs and utilizes its resources. So really the goal of doing a community needs assessment is to understand how, well, one, to learn what the need is if it's not already um, apparent to you and figuring out, you know, what what gaps need to be filled and what resources already exist or need to be developed. So another chat share is what would you like to assess in your community? So thinking about the need um, as kind of the larger umbrella um, topic, what within that do you need to assess in order to identify fully what the needs are and to utilize resources? So I'm seeing federal money allocation, Anything else of, you know, ideally, if you were to do a community needs assessment based on these topics, what would you like to assess in your community? Yep, current resources available. Yep, you never want to just kind of recreate the wheel. Access to Medicaid and Medicare. Yep, students not, ha not having past classes. Um, the needs of veterans. Um, what after school curriculum may exist or need to um, be created. Um, shut-ins, um, skill sets of immigrants and refugees, yep, definitely within um, agriculture. Yep, just in general, access to higher education, yeah, there's a lot there. Resources for the elderly, I'm seeing Amanda said, knowledge of how to access, access local produce and incentives for buying Produce, interest in community gardening space in specific areas, yep, quality of life, park amenities, facilities, volunteer engagement. Um, does university budgets count? Yes. Water quality. Yeah, so these are some great things of kind of thinking under that broad, um, you know, need, what would you fully need to assess? Special education resources. So I'm seeing a lot of people uh, mentioning, you know, resources that already exist. I think that's something that should always be on the forefront of your mind when you are thinking about uh, community needs and assessing them. Um, also, community willingness. That's a really great thing. Um, you know, if you come in and you, you identify a need, you have to make sure that the community is willing to engage and that they have been um, fully vetted in what they're actually looking for. Mobility issues. Yeah, these are great. I really appreciate y'all um, contributing to the chat share. So I'll just move on now that we've kind of identified what are the definitions of a community, a need, and an assessment. So after you've kind of identified, or you now know what um, the definitions are, I'm gonna get into what the um, kinds of assessments uh, we've been able to identify. Um, and so I love these little taglines. You've got options. 
Okay, so just giving a few examples, I'm sure there's other examples of, you know, that we can get further into of examples of community needs assessments, but the easiest way to think about it for the time that we're going to spend together is non-participatory as well as participatory. It's really easy to kind of put these into the two pillars. And um, here, I'm not saying you kind of, you have to choose one or the other. These are just ways that you can kind of um, think about your assessment and think about, um, you know, the time and the capacity and the resource, resources that you have um, to do this um, assessment. So non-participatory ones are going to be things um, of kind of like People have participated in the census, that's a good example, but it's not you having to participate with the community per se. Um, and while I'm going over the slide, feel free to answer the chat share question of how else would you learn about the community if you weren't, or if, if you see something, or if you don't see something on these slides, feel free to include it in the chat. So um, non-participatory, you're going to think about, you know, data that is already there and available to you. So U.S. Census data is a really great way to find just general kind of overarching um, information about a community. Census, you know, they um, cover population size as well as, um, you know, ethnicity that falls into that or race, um, age, poverty levels, um, graduation rates, all sorts of information. So you can gather a lot of information from the U.S. Census, as well as county health rankings. Um, and we've included the websites here if anyone is interested in taking a look at those. County health rankings, they're going to show you, it's going to show you information about kind of the general health of a community. And these are usually based off of geographical areas, so you want to keep that in mind. Scholarly journals and research is a really great um, place to find, um, you know, some um, results of studies or information that has already taken place within a community. Publications from the state, county, or nonprofit organizations. Um, as well as Google Trends and Google Maps. Um, it's not, Google Maps is not just for getting you from point A to point B. You can actually find a lot of statistical data there as well. Um, and then participatory, um, you know, examples of community assessments are going to include um, surveys that you're sending out to the community public forums, um, focus groups, individual interviews, as well as direct observation. So an example we give here is, you know, sitting in a public space and note how many people are using that public space. Um, so getting into the chat share, it looks like um, folks answered the chat share question of how else would you learn about the community? Um, so hosting a community event, Yes, that is a really great idea. That's kind of where it gets into the participatory um, area of community assessments. Talking to community leaders, such as Chamber of Commerce, local business leaders. Um, Lori, that's a great idea. Um, community leaders are often in communication pretty frequently with constituents. Um, and so they are able to gather information and hopefully pass that along. Um, town hall meetings, um, that's a great idea. School board meetings, YMCA meetings. Yeah, just going to a place where someone is already gathering people. Um, looks like you can read on the history of Native people through a textbook. Yep, you can gather some information there, interact with community leaders, um, and then volunteering yourself. Yep, this is a great way um, to learn about the community. Um, and I think the biggest thing that, or the biggest takeaway that I've learned is really just talking to people and getting to know them in the terms of like, what do they see as the biggest need in your community? What's important to them? Ask them, you know, why do you get involved in this sort of work? Um, why are you here today? Just simply opening it up to have a dialogue. You can learn a lot about folks. Surveys are a great way to, um, you know, utilize if it's just you and another person um, doing a needs assessment. Using surveys is a great way to kind of disseminate that information out to a lot of people, and then you just get the data. Um, you really want to be thinking about um, these examples in terms of, uh, as I mentioned, you know, how much time do you have to, to do this community needs assessment? 
how much, you know, resources, your capacity, um, and really identifying what you can do within the um, dedicated timeline that you have. I know most of you on this call are, um, you know, national service members um, who serve anywhere from like 10 weeks, six months, nine months, up to 12 months. And so it's really important if you are tasked with doing a community needs assessment within your national service to really be thinking about how much time are you going to commit to the needs assessment before you move on to the next step of really engaging, evaluating, um, implementing that sort of thing. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that, um, you know, when you start a project, you do not have to recreate the wheel when it comes to community needs assessment. If someone has already done a needs assessment recently, you can most likely pull from that information um, or really focus on this non-participatory um, examples of utilizing the statistics that are already there or the work of someone who came before you. Okay, so there's even more examples. So we pulled some information from the Peace Corps um, PACA field guide, and it has a lot of creative community assessment activities. So here are a few. These are a bit more interactive um, kind of with the community. So it's going to be that participatory um, type of community needs assessment. So community mapping, it comes down to participants, they draw a map of the community and indicate the most important features of that community. So these features could most likely, um, they're probably going to most likely be like infrastructure that already exists within the community or culture, um, cultural aspects that take place in that community. And that's a really great way that you can figure out what is the most important features, um, especially culturally. Um, some communities um, kind of do things differently than maybe you would assume that they uh, assume how they would do things or what is the most important. So community mapping, it's also kind of a fun way to get folks involved. So this would probably have to take place in person or if you found some sort of online platform that could, you know, they could just put their input into. Um, the second one is social network mapping. So they draw a network map of the relationships between people and people in the community. So how are these folks really interacting with each other um, and what are the benefits of that interaction as well? And then the third one is people shadowing. Um, so this one actually seems like a lot of fun to me. Um, and it would be it would include in, um, accompanying a community member as they go about their daily life and see how they interact with the world. Okay, so getting into conducting a, an assessment. Um, so failing to plan is planning to fail is what the tagline is for this one. So I want to make sure you're always setting yourself up for success and not just, you know, building the plane as you fly it. You really want to be thinking about um, how are you going to map this out? So when is a good time to conduct a community assessment? And a good time, um, always when you're starting something new, when you have an idea or you come into a project and they're like, this is what we're thinking. Well, you can't assume that you know everything about the community and what their needs are. So if you're starting something new, you don't want to just, you know, fly in and say, I know exactly how to solve this problem. You really want to be thinking about getting that input from community members. Um, if there's doubt about the most important need, if you're like, well, I know this is a need, or I think this is a need, and there's this other need around, what should we do? Um, if there's any doubt, it's always good to ask the community. Um, another good time is when you need to convince funders of something. Um, that really ties into grant writing and fundraising, or even getting donations for the um, project or the program that you want to implement. Um, another good time is just, you know, this glaring thing of if the community has asked for it. Um, and also, if you want to be sure of the community's support. So someone mentioned in the chat, you know, community's willingness. This is where this, you know, comes into play. If you don't think that your community would support your project, then you want to make sure and do a community assessment. 
So a bad time to conduct a community assessment is going to be if there's no doubt about the most important need. If it is very glaring, it's very obvious, people have talked about it, or there's already been a needs assessment done, and there's no doubt. You don't need to do it again. Excuse me. Um, if there is an urgent cause for action um, and an assessment has been conducted recently, um, as I mentioned, you know, you don't want to recreate the wheel. If someone has already conducted one. Um, you don't need to recreate it. If there's an urgent cause for action, that is often um, we see like there's no need for it's a bad time to do a community assessment need um, in the time of like natural disaster or crisis. You don't really have time. You just need to act. Um, and the last one of a bad time to conduct a community assessment is the community feels that an assessment would be redundant or wasteful. Okay, so you want to make sure that when you're approaching a community needs assessment that you have an asset based mindset. So um, a quote from the community toolbox, many community organizations focus on the needs or deficits of the community. Every community has needs and deficits that ought to be um, attended to, but it's also possible to focus on assets and strengths, emphasizing that the community does have not what it doesn't. Those assets and strengths can be used to meet the same community needs and they can improve community life. So this is really important to think about and also feel free to um, answer the question in the chat share. What are some assets in your community? Um, so we bring this quote up because um, sometimes, especially when you're um, working with, you know, historically marginalized communities or underserved communities, um, they probably already have been told or have this mindset of what are we lacking, what don't we have, we're not good enough, etc. So you really want to be focusing on the asset, assets and the strengths of the community and what they do have, um, you know. Think about what resources do exist. Um, what are some cultural benefits of how they kind of view and approach the world around them? Um, and also, it kind of just makes you feel a little bit better when you're doing this type of work. Um, and also, I think there it results in a bit more of community willingness and input when you're really focusing on the things that they do bring to the table, not the deficits that exist in that community. So with the chat share, I'm seeing, you know, the question is, what are some assets in your community? What I'm seeing is um, resilience. Um, community members care about each other. That is a big one. Um, I, Ray, I'm not sure what various CBOs are. So if you want to elaborate, feel free to do that. Um, strong social fabric and networking. Yep, uh, Ethan says in Missoula, we have many daycares and child care centers who attend or who are dedicated to helping children. Um, Shannon mentioned the Lexington Pride Center, um, good school funding, community-based organizations. Oh, I see, right, thank you. Um, Missoula has really good engagement in community events, great public schools, amazing library. Yes, those are some great assets um, that communities have. Um, Kayla mentioned the Nationwide Children's Hospital. Yes, so these are great assets that you can think of. You know, Kayla, at a children's hospital, if you're trying to assess the need of what lacks in your community in regards to children's health, um, you know, consulting with um, doctors, researchers, um, anyone at the children's hospital, that could be a great way, a good route to go. Um, there are other centers. Um, so Center for Immigrants and Refugees, English Language Change um, Training, Opportunities to Colleges and Universities in Montana. Yeah, so I think um, things that popped out to me in here in the chat were especially like the strong social fabric and network, community members care about each other. Um, it's really good to really focus in on those sorts of assets, um, as well as like the infrastructure that does exist and the knowledge and expertise that does exist in that community. Great, so I'll just keep moving along. So here's another chat share that you can um, enter a response into the chat for. So what steps would you take to bring DEI into your assessment? And so DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. You could also um, incorporate accessibility into that as well. So you wanna make sure that when you're thinking about conducting a community needs assessment that you're making it inclusive, accessible, and equitable. 
Um, so a few quotes out of the community toolbox um, mention that many people that haven't had a great deal of formal education belong to groups that are often denied a voice in community affairs or belong to a culture other than the mainstream one. Um, the mainstream one don't have the meeting and deliberation skills that many middle class citizens take for granted. Um, some folks, they may need training and or mentoring to learn how to contribute effectively to a planning group. So you want to think about that. Um, another um, quote out of the community toolbox was, your plan should make sure that the assessment includes the opportunity for all points of view to be aired. You may not like what's, what some people have to say, but if you don't know that there are people with differing opinions, you only have half of the information you need. Um, and yes, so when thinking about that, you want to, especially for accessibility, when I was a service member, um, you know, I had cohort um, mates that were thinking about doing community needs assessment, and some people just didn't show up to their public forum or their interviews and whatnot, and they realized that their events were not accessible. Um, folks did, there was not food available and folks were having to miss dinner. Um, there was not child care um, available to them. And so they couldn't come because they didn't have someone to watch their children um, or the space that they had chosen to hold the event was not accessible to folks. So you want to be thinking about that. Also, um, you know, you want to invite um, if you're doing a, participa a part participatory um, community assessment and doing some sort of survey or focus group, it needs to be inclusive. It needs to be representative of that entire community and not just, um, you know, one race or ethnicity, nationality, that sort of thing. You really want to be thinking about, okay, how do I get a full representative of my community? So if you're doing any sort of like flyering around your community, you want to make sure that you're identifying locations where it's not just, you know, uh, um, primarily like white person space. You want to be thinking about other locations where people around the entire community are going to be. So chat share, what st steps would you take to bring DEI into your assessment? I'm seeing a lot of answers. So I'll try to review most of them. Um, use inclusive language when writing survey questions, write questions that are for underserved populations. Um, Shannon mentions they would reach out to underserved community members. Um, yep, a lot of making sure that the language is easy to understand. Change wording and language to meet the needs of the people that may not speak your language. That's a great um, observation is really think about, you know, your community and what um, languages those representatives speak. Um, assessing where the diver assessing where the diversity located is it in your area or is it located elsewhere? Um, yep, release materials in multiple languages. Find a location where resources are accessible to everyone in the community. Um, multiple ways to complete the assessment, written and online. That is a great observation as well. Um, a hybrid option, intercultural learning and sharing of food types and food production. That might have been an answer to a previous question. I'm not quite sure. But yes, these are um, really great observations and how you can bring DEI into your assessment. Really be thinking about meeting the needs of all the people that you want to hear from. Okay, so I kind of rushed through that because we just have about... Maggie, will you remind me, is it um, noon or 12.15? We're scheduled until 12.15. Oh, great. Okay, so yeah. we have a little bit of time. So what I'd like to do now um, and give you all some time and space to do a small breakout and do a learn and share. So we're going to do um, small breakout groups through Zoom. And so what we're hoping for seven minutes is that all um, folks that are in your chat or in your breakout room can discuss a time you participated in or performed a community assessment. What went smoothly and what didn't. So Maggie's going to do the breakout room. So it might take a minute or so. So please be patient um, to make sure that we can all get you in a room.
And there should be a box that pops up on your screen that says you've been invited to um, breakout room number and it will give you a number and you just hit um, like okay or enter room. Um, and we'll give you about seven minutes to do that. And then we're gonna reconvene um, and kind of talk about what the major themes were. So feel free to um, join. I see the box has popped up. It's like we have about nine rooms with anywhere between, you know, four or five and up of people. Uh, Maggie, it looks like Abby um, was unassigned a room. And then Maggie, it also looks like we got some stuff in here of in the chat of Elsa mentions that their audio and video need to be in the same room. So I'm assuming they joined with video and audio on different um, machines. Maggie, I don't know if you're able to change it, but I'm seeing Elsa's audio is in room six and not. Elsa should also be in room six. Um, okay. It looks like she's joined with her audio. It um, looks like oh, room. Oh, nope, I see it. Okay, let me. Yeah. There we go. Great. And then, so I think, is it just me and you in this big room now? Should be. Maybe Pete, he didn't I meant to unassign him, but it doesn't really matter. He didn't join. Okay. Ouch. Thanks, Maggie. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm here. I just, uh, it's not me. You know, it's just not me. <laughs> I didn't know that you needed to be part of a breakout room. I didn't know you wanted I really, to be in I really, I really appreciate that you did, Maggie. That means a lot to me. <laughs> 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 Well, guys, I don't think Sam got a uh, second interview for that position at his work, so. Oh, um, darn. Sam. Well, it was weird because in the interview, they told him, like, we're surprised to, that you applied for this position because it seems like your pathway would actually be to, like, this other position, like a production manager. Wasn't he encouraged to apply? He was, which I'm really confused about. That's like, bizarre. Well, it's only just like getting the like name that. in front of people. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like it's always good to like practice with interviews, you know, but um, I just, I have no idea when a produ production manager position would become available at the plant. So it's kind of just like a sit and wait for this opportunity to arise. I'm not quite sure or move to a different plant. I don't know. I just feel bad because it was like the two older women in his office were the ones that got called back for a second interview. <laughs> oh, well. What are you gonna do? Well, I mean, I don't know how many interviews it's had, but it's always, it is, it, sometimes if you don't get the outcome you want, at least it's decent practice for interviews because there is an art to it. Like, I think people just, you know, they either put a lot of pressure on themselves or they're just like, F this, I'm just going to walk it. And it's like, the reality is obviously it's somewhere in the middle. And yeah, like, there is an art to it. There is something, you know, you, you can script it and you can do everything. But ultimately, it's like, if you've been, if you've basically been called to interview, you've already been like, they've already decided that you're probably fit for the position. They just want to make sure you're a fit for the for the environment more than anything. 
Yeah. And that brings me nicely onto Maggie's interview. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, wow, well, that's a shame. Maggie, if you could just, just uh, what me and Callie just talk about your interview. What? What are you mumbling about over there? <laughs> anyway, well, I'm sure there'll be other opportunities. Bailey yeah. is a different plant. I don't really know the local industry. Would he have to move? Far or if you went with a different plant, yes. Like we have looked at other plants that are around, and like there's ones in you know most of the fifty states, um, but some of them are in like really rural areas that we'd never want to move to. And then there's one in like Tacoma, Washington, one in Florida. I think there's one in Illinois. But it's just a matter of like what position he would want and I don't think either one of us really want to move anytime soon so I don't know I just felt bad because he was texting me this morning being like I don't feel motivated or feel like I have any purpose of being here and all this stuff and I was like oh no it is so frustrating to be encouraged to apply for a position which generally means like you have the position you just have to interview and then suddenly get shot down that is feels like something was not communicated I think oh, his I boss just me. like walked around the office one day and was like, hey, we're hiring for this. I strongly enc encourage you to apply. And then he probably said it to like 15 people. Uh -huh. Possible. So oh, I don't know. Was I just it? feel like he's having like an existential crisis today when he's like, okay, I'm not going to get this position. So like, what am I actually doing here? Sort of like vibe is what I'm feeling. I don't know. It's also Monday. It's also yeah, Mondays can get hard. And it, yeah, that's that is something to bear in mind. And it's cloudy. Right. I hear you guys got snow. I didn't get any snow. We did, oh, sorry, yeah. Just two seconds. I've got um I've got a phone call coming in. Okay. Slipped and slid my way to work today. I know. I was like shuffling and then I like got to campus and I was like. Uh, I forgot my laptop and then I had turned back around and like shuffle back down back with I was like mm. so demoralizing to it's like <laughs> gives me a glimpse into what being elderly is gonna be like yeah I think about that all the time I was thinking about that this morning I was like if I was like you know 20 mm, like yeah like 30 years older like I wouldn't leave my house in the snow because I'd be so afraid of slipping that's me with driving though because I feel like I struggle a lot in the snow I just get scared Mm -hmm. also I hope the Paltrick's workflow goes through this it seems like it went through to everybody but I guess like some people have filters on their emails so I updated a few people's emails so we'll see but it's supposed to go out in two minutes and I have my email on it and I got the first one so I don't really know yeah I don't think I was on it because I was looking at my spam folder to be like oh maybe Wednesday. Right, I didn't put you on the contact list I no you're fine I don't need so to it's like I don't think you need emails no all the time have I probably have been to enough CBIs though to get the badge. <laughs> should have <applied. laughs> I should have gotten the badge. Um, I also don't remember exactly when they went into these rooms. If it's been seven minutes, I always just do twelve o'clock, and then you can close them out. Okay. I think you put them in. Honestly, I don't remember either. Um, at eleven fifty-one is when Elsa last messaged. So around then. Oh, yeah. I'll wait a minute. And I can close all the rooms, so I'll just go ahead and do that. Close, 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 close. What? Close, 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 close. Snow? Close. Close, 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 close. Close all the rooms. Okay, I'm closing them now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'll close them in a minute, so I'll hit close all rooms, and then it'll... They can come back, or they have 60 seconds to leave. Yeah, they come. Catherine, is your office in a very colorful closet? Um, yeah, this is our little storage closet. We've got like banners that our students have made in the past for our program. And then this is our filing cabinet. Um, 
we bought all of these little magnets to like label the drawers, but we have like 30 drawers and like 500 magnets. So we use them to make little artworks for each other. I like it. Yeah, it's really nice. Much more colorful than my office. <laughs> these beige walls. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so it looks like most people are back. I'm seeing some familiar faces. I think they all closed. Okay. Okay. So I can't remember exactly who was in groups with who, but if anyone would like to share kind of a theme or what they had talked about um, in their group discussion. And the question was, discuss a time you participated in or performed a community assessment. What, what went smoothly and what didn't? So maybe we can talk about, um, yeah, first what went smoothly, if anyone would like to share, um, and then we can talk about what didn't go smoothly. So feel free to just let, unmute or enter it in the chat, um, but I'd love to hear if anything kind of surfaced during your, your um, discussions. Breakout group one had some good discussions about the accessibility and specifically using technology to complete surveys. So just thinking about um, people who don't have access to phones or don't know how to use QR codes or even just have um, trouble typing. So we kind of brought up that, um, you know, it's easier in a way to do online surveys, but it might not be easy for the participants. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Um, well, one thing within, the, like, kind of right off the bat of being at University of Montana was very low student engagement. Like, that's one of the biggest challenges. And it's hard to do in a community assessment when the problem is low engagement. And so figuring out ways to hear from the community and hear from students who may not be as active um, has definitely been a hurdle. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I'm sure you've already thought about it, Jesse, but free food. <laughs> yeah, everyone says that. Doesn't always work. Does not but always work. You literally have to like put yourself in front of people and say like, I'm here and I'm gonna force you to meet with me. Yeah, <laughs> that, works. <laughs> that works. That works, okay. I don't know, just say free pizza, free pizza, free pizza. Like you're saying Beetlejuice. And you'll get some engagement there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm seeing some stuff in the chat. Would anyone else like to um, unmute and share what their group talked about? I can just share another thing that we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, so for the, like type of participatory assessment where you just kind of observe um, people in an environment. We talked about how it can be difficult in those moments to actually get the information like written down. Um, I was at a booth kind of handing out some materials and trying to also assess the community's reactions. And I remembered for like the week after kind of what their reactions were, but now I forget how they were reacting to like the materials we handed out. And mm -hmm. um, so writing things down is important. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I've only been involved in one um, community assessment that required me to observe. And it was actually pretty simple. I just sat at an intersection and counted the number of pedestrians and bicyclists. So yes, if I had to communicate with them as well, that probably would have been a lot harder. Whereas, yeah, my experience was just little check marks. <laughs> okay. Um, we got some um, responses in the chat. So Ray said, um, try to assess the level of interest within the public school system and at various locations um, to get involved with broader changes initiatives. 
main challenge was xenophobia, um, being a newcomer and meeting residents, um, especially in a small town like Miles City, um, which is in Montana, with only 8,000 residents who all know each other. Um, apathy is a real challenge within a two-year college. So yes, those are definitely some challenges, um, especially being a newcomer. Um, we've seen a lot of that, especially um, for our AmeriCorps members that are serving on um, federally recognized um, tribal reservations. Um, I know there that is quite a challenge there as well. Um, Someone else mentioned that there were only two people who have completed some type of survey in group six. One thing that we talked about um, was the low numbers. I've just completed a partner survey and that should be out this week. And one thing I was worried about was number of responses I'll receive. Um, someone said that Google Forms is great and it made me think about how we are going to conduct the survey and will it be reachable to all partners? Yep. So um, that is a common thing of making it accessible. Um, so for the last few minutes before I open it up for questions, I'm going to give a couple real world examples of really putting the theory into practice. Um, for me, I know that my community assessments, you know, I was striving for, um, you know, not perfect, but good um, when I was doing these community assessments. Um, and so I'm going to just give the examples of the ones that I have been involved in. Um, so a couple of years ago within Montana Campus Compact, um, we were looking to identify a direction for us, um, our organization, to support members in um, service sites regarding inclusion and belonging for our members. And so what we did was um, we used Qualtrics, which is an online platform. You were all using it today for that pre-survey. And we distributed a survey to all of our AmeriCorps members as well as their service site supervisors. Um, once we did that, and we got our initial results. Um, we conducted individual conversations with members and supervisors to identify gaps in our current resources. Um, you know, if someone came back on the survey and said, yes, they feel um, a sense of belonging and inclusion, um, we didn't really reach out and do individual conversations. We were really trying to focus on the folks that um, mentioned that they weren't, they didn't feel um, inclusion or belonging. Um, so the results showed that new members moving from out of state, as well as non-white members, felt a sense of belonging less than other members. Um, so this allowed us to um, time to really think about what resources we wanted to create for those members, especially incoming members and members um, that did not identify with the same race as, you know, their service, um, you know, staff or supervisors. And so this allowed Montana Campus Compact to focus on establishing additional resources for members and more intensive training for service site supervisors and staff. Um, but really what we noticed was that there was a gap in our resources and our training for our site supervisors. So we wanted to create, um, you know, space and materials and information and resources for sites um, that were bringing on a member that were, was coming from outside of Montana, as well as members that um, identified as non-white. Um, so that is the most recent example that I can give um, for our office. Um, and so what we plan to do is um, every year or every couple of years, we're also going to send out that same survey to all of our um, AmeriCorps members to kind of reevaluate um, you know, the sense of inclusion and belonging, um, not only within our office, but, you know, out at their service sites, as well as their local communities that they're serving. Um, another example was from my AmeriCorps service term. So as I mentioned earlier, I served um, two consecutive service terms with the same organization, which was the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, and so I was their second AmeriCorps member after they had started the Smart Schools program. And so when I came in, they had already kind of done a community assessment before they started the first year, but it was pretty minimal. And so what I wanted to do after, you know, the first year was completed and I came into service, what I was hoping to do was to really see, okay, what happened the first year and can I reassess this community? So I used Google Docs to survey all schools who were invited to participate the initial year. So these are schools that decided it wasn't for them and the schools who had actually signed up for the program. Excuse me. So what I was really looking to do was tailor the program through their feedback. Um, and so I was trying to gauge, okay, we got 
these schools participated, how do I keep them, um, you know, re-signing up year over year? And how do I then capture some of the schools who decided that um, the program was not for them? What was the program lacking? Um, so the need that was identified was that the program lacked a robust educational component. Um, we were trying to get schools to focus on resource conservation, um, but they were like, well, we can do that through our facilities and superintendents, but how are you involving our students in this? You want them to participate in resource conservation, um, but what does that mean for them? How should we educate them on resource conservation, especially these like rural communities um, where there were schools that were just a one room schoolhouse and they had like 14 students and they had teachers that had never really been trained or looked into resource conservation. So what does that mean for their students in their school? So what I did um, is I created curriculum with staff that worked at the Department of Environmental Quality, um, and I sent that curriculum to teachers, um, and I also offered to schedule visits to all schools that decided to participate in the program so I myself could do the education to their students if their teachers did not feel um, like they had the resources or the expertise. So it that's pretty much my two real world experiences. Um, they were a bit ago, especially the smart schools one. And then I think the belonging and inclusion one was about two years ago. Um, and so if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but that's pretty much what I have for my real world um, experiences. So as we're getting towards the end, we're at 12-12, the key takeaways for today's session is um, to use a community assessment to identify important needs. Um, and there are also many ways to perform a community assessment. And then the biggest takeaway in my eyes is don't exclude community members from an assessment, either intentionally or unintentionally. You're not going to get the results. And you want to remember, you might learn things that don't really make you feel too good on the inside, or you're going to interact with people that have different um, opinions than you. But it is important that no matter what the opinion is, that you are um, recording it, you're, you are um, you know, thinking about it, and you're taking it seriously. Okay, so just want to say thank you for attending. Um, I went ahead and put my full name um, and my email here. If anyone would like to, you know, reach out about anything, really, um, that's the best way to reach me. Um, and again, my name is Callie Foster. I am the Director of Programs with Montana Campus Compact. Um, and I am more than willing to stick around for a few minutes if anyone has any questions. But Maggie, if there's anything that you need to follow up with, I'll turn it over to you. Um, yeah, we can open up for questions. You guys should have received a reflection survey in your email. Again, if you haven't, feel free to throw your email in the chat and I can update the contact list. I also put my email in the chat if anyone has any questions following up on this. Um, Thank you all for attending the first session of CBI. And um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and ask now. I'll ask one, Maggie, when's the next session of CBI? Um, the next session will be Wednesday, the same time at the same Zoom link. You guys all should have received calendar invites as well as an introductory email. Again, if not, please let me know. Um, but yeah, I'll see you guys all at Wednesday at 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time if no one has any follow-up questions. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thanks, guys.